Howdy folks, welcome back to World of Tanks with the Mighty Jingles. It's random acts of violence again. It's a collection of replays from my uh, save game folder. Today it's all about the tank destroyers. You're going to get a replay from the Tiger, the Object 704, and of course the Mighty Mighty Ferdinand. This was a platoon game with circumflexes in the ISU 152 and Ector in the Tiger 2, Ector from Wargaming. Ector, of course, you may know from the EU forums. He's, uh, well, at the time that we played this game, he was an EU community team member working out of Wargaming Paris. Now he's been promoted. He's the manager of the English language EU community team. He's far too busy to join us for random games anymore. Well, we're here on Mountain Pass. It's a tier 8 game, and the Ferdinand's 128mm gun loves playing tier 8 games. Having said that, Circumflex is in the ISU 152 with that beast of a gun. Yeah, he's going to be having some fun with a troll cannon. Coming around the corner up to uh, your traditional heavy tank camping spot. This is a good spot for providing there isn't any artillery and there isn't any artillery. The top of the glacier road back there is a fantastic position for tanks that have good turrets and can get hull down with good gun depression. So American heavies mostly. Not ARL 44s. Oh, there goes half of his health. Right, I did take a hit there. Somebody's getting real brave and pushing the corner, but the ARL just doesn't seem to know what's good for him. So there's my first kill. Big bad boy comes around the corner, but I'm on the inside, and I am confident he is going to be taking shots at those juicy mediums on the outside, rather than me. Unfortunately, we just lost Hector, so Hector, my apologies. I'm not really making you look good in this video. <laughs> Don't worry, it happens to us all. I'm one kill up, but Circumflexes is... well, he's Circumflexes, and he's driving an ISU 152. And we wait. We know there's some big tanks around this corner, and coming around a corner the Ferdinand is quite vulnerable. 200mm of frontal armour, oh, get the gun down, bang, yes, thank you, thank you, there we go, and he fires into my upper casement. <laughs> and it's angled, there's no way he's going to penetrate that. Come around again, and there's the Tiger 2, and he's stock, and I completely donk that shot, and get shot in the back by my own team, hooray! <laughs> it's the M4. Genius. Alright. And it, is he botting? He's just firing randomly. At... I'm getting real worried about this Sherman behind me at this point. He's just firing directly at those tanks, regardless of the fact that there's solid rock between him and them. I, th I think he may be botting. I advance on the corner again, and this is poor situational awareness from me. I'm not paying attention to my minimap. There. Now, I didn't have much warning. Put a shot into the T-43. Half a second after that Tiger II over on the left popped up on my map. It wasn't really my fault. He put a shot into me, and I was lucky. All it did was blow my tracks off. Of course, with the Tiger II on the flank, that we, we can't push this corner anymore. That guy needs to die before we can go around. The Super Pershing in front of me, d taking hits, does not seem to be aware of the fact that there's a Tiger II over there. So we're kind of stuck here. We, we can't go and deal with the Tiger II because that's going to give our flank to all the tanks around this corner. And we can't go around the corner because that's going to give our flanks to the Tiger II. And I have a fair amount of health left, but I, I don't want to just throw it away. The game's pretty close. Scores at 7-7. Seven, seven. Circumflex has just nailed another one. We need that Tiger 2 to be dealt with. Either somebody's got to go to him, or he's going to come to us. Well, you know, that works too. This guy comes around the corner... Please come around the corner. We would all like to shoot you. 
There he is. And I miss. But he bounces off me. Where's that T-34 gone? Oh, he's given us his side. Genius. <laughs> Somebody's never heard of angling. And I take a hit. And it looks like he's using the long 88. It looks like a mostly stock Tiger II. Circumflexes finishes him off. And it really does look like that frickin' Sherman is just firing randomly. At, he's got to be botting. But anyway, we've got this corner now. This, well, he's dead. <laughs> Circumflexus finishes him off as well. He's on a roll. Check out the number of kills Circumflexus had. Unfortunately, he ain't getting no more. So you get to Top Gun and an early bath. Circumflexus is out, but hey, he's done a good job. And now it's on and into the enemy base. And oh joy, I have this Sherman as backup. Well, I can at least use him as an enemy tank detector. He's going to get up there ahead of me, and when he bursts into flames, I know there's an enemy tank around the corner. A lot of people get very upset when I call this thing the Ferdinand. They keep saying, oh, Jingles, no, oh, actually, the correct name for the vehicle was the Panzerjäger Elephant. Well, it was and it wasn't. When this machine was first introduced, it was known as the Ferdinand, in honour of the designer, Ferdinand Porsche. He obviously recycled the hulls of his failed Tiger P prototypes, Stuck a casement and a dirty great gun on top, and this thing first saw combat experience as the Ferdinand tank destroyer in the Battle of Kursk in 1943. 89 of these were committed to combat at Kursk, and they achieved, well, the best ratio of kills per loss of any tank destroyer of World War II, 10 to 1. They did very well in the opening stages of the battle, when the Germans were on the offensive, but there were some problems. All-round vision for the commander wasn't very good. Once they'd advanced through the Russian lines, they became very, very vulnerable to infantry, just hiding in the trenches, waiting for them to pass over, and then swarming them. So, modifications were made. Uh, they had a modified commander's cupola from the Stug 3, and they were given an MG-34 ball mounting in the front of the hull to help protect them against infantry. The modified version of the Ferdinand as of 1944, was then known as the Panzerjäger Elephant. So when people tell you, no, it's not the Ferdinand, it's the Elephant, they're wrong. It was both. Not interested in capping here. There's only one enemy tank left, and there's only really one place he can be. There he is. He's seen me. His gun's turning around. Put one into his commander's cupola, and he bounces off my upper casement. <laughs> Game over. Sneaky little bit of extra damage there at the end. Two of these machines survived the war. One, captured by the Soviets at Kursk, is on display at the Kubinka Tank Museum, just outside Moscow. The second one, surprisingly, captured at Anzio in Italy. Uh, at over 70 tonnes, this tank was just not able to effectively use Italian roads and bridges, but the Wehrmacht used them in Italy anyway. The one captured at Anzio is on display at the US Army Ordnance Museum at Fort Lee in Virginia. Next up, the Object 704 with the BL-10, the mighty troll cannon. You may have seen parts of this particular battle before. I have used certain segments from it in a Joy of Derp kill shot video. But this is the whole battle, I'm platooned with Ike and Quickie Baby. For a long time, the Object 704 was it, as far as Soviet tank destroyers went. There was no Object 268. There was no second Soviet tank destroyer line leading to the Object 263. The Object 704 was as far as Soviet tank destroyers went, but you really have no problem getting into tier 10 games with this thing. 286mm penetration with the armor-piercing shells on the BL-10 gun. You, this thing just is not afraid of tier 10 tanks. One thing I'd like to point out in this game, and one of the reasons why we were able to be so successful here, have a look at our 5916 scout tank. Now the 5916 is not a very good tank. And you really can't expect to be able to do any damage in that tiny little Chinese scout tank in a tier 10 match, but look at the position that he's gone to here on Prokhorovka. With that scout in that location, sitting in those bushes up there off to my right, the enemy team are completely unable to advance down this road without being seen. 
the success that we had on this side of the map was largely down to one guy in a scout tank being patient and just not throwing his tank away right at the start of the match. I wish more light tank drivers would do what this guy does. There are multiple lines of concealment between me and all of those enemy tanks. I'm not going to see them even if they fire, but he will. Now I'm too low in the ground here to have effective shots at those guys on the other side of the road. But patience is a virtue. Right now we're just waiting to see who's going to blink first. He said, and then he moved up. I'm going to move to a slightly better position, trying to get some higher ground here, so that when those guys fire and the 5916 spots them, I'm actually in a position to fire the gun effectively. And it doesn't take a lot, and this is actually a better spot. Multiple lines of concealment between me and the various enemies. I don't have effective shots at the guys in the middle. A couple of heavies moving up. Big heavies. Okay, and there we go. Oh yes please. <laughs> you almost feel sorry for them. Poor KV4. Oh, he's given me his side. Oh, no, he's in lower ground. Is he going to get away? Yeah, missed. Never mind. Plenty more where that one came from. Now, T110E4. T-110E4 there, working the ridge line, very, very bad position for him. T-110E4 has terrible gun depression. You have to expose so much of that tank in order to be able to fire over a ridge, and your frontal armour is pretty bad. I don't have a very clear shot at this guy. Now, the armour of the Object 704 isn't great either. But it's sloped, and it's angled. And sloping and angling... Well, the T110E4 has nearly 300 millimeters of penetration. Will I have a shot at him? Just. It's not a very good shot. In fact, it's a very, very bad shot. On the other hand, I have plenty of targets to my front. There's the E4. Oh, <laughs> he felt that one. And I bounced a shot. The E4 and the object have broadly similar guns, even though one's tier 9 and one's tier 8. They both have very high penetration, and they're both not very accurate. But in a fight between an E4 and an object 704, well, I'll just kill this KV4 while we wait. There we go. The 286mm penetration of the BR-10, the 298mm penetration of the E-4's gun, are roughly similar. But the 704 has sloped armour. It will bounce shots from any calibre of gun that just won't happen when you're shooting at the E-4. The E-4's armour is terrible, and it's all flat. Here we go. I bounce. He doesn't. <laughs> Object 704 wins. Oh, okay. The T110E5 managed to score a good hit. But I'm about to reload, and... Well, I would have had to score an above-average damage roll in order to kill him. Uh, and he misses his next shot, and he's not going to survive the next few seconds. But, um, yeah, that was a bit of a below-average damage roll still. Getting a below-average damage roll on this gun still means you've done well over 600 damage. And now we found their artillery. And unfortunately, all 5916. You see what happens the second he tries to actually shoot something? <laughs> but he did a good job scouting on this map. So hopefully... Um, yeah, the M40 didn't bother moving. The GW Panther is moving. I'm not going to reload in time to kill him. So... No, he's going to get away. Well, he's going to get away from me. He's not going to get away. <laughs> He's going to die very, very soon. There he goes. And now there's just three remaining enemy tanks left on the hill. 
Ike's had a monster game up there in his M46. He's on four kills. 704 is pretty quick in a straight line. Doesn't turn very well. But quick enough to get into view range of these guys. There's a 215B. He's about to disappear. I fire blind. Did I hit him? Well, he did have 800 health. When you see him again, he's going to have substantially less than 800 health. So yes, I did hit him. There's an IS-8 and an IS-3 up there as well. There he is. Put him out of his misery. Thank you. Four kills each for me and Ike. Just the IS-8 and the IS-3. We've spotted them both. Ike's doing a great job up there. This would be nice if I could hit the IS-8. So, of course, it misses. <laughs> but that's the BL-10 for you. It's so satisfying when it hits, you have to put up with a bit of inaccuracy. Oh, artillery just nailed the IS-8. In order to hit this IS-3, he's going to have to back up. So, of course, he obligingly backs up for me, and boom. <laughs> Another below-average damage roll, but hey, damage is damage. We've blown his tracks off. All sorts of spotting and assistance damage there for me. Game over. So there you go, a decent little result in the Object 704 Tier 9 Tank Destroyer with a BL-10 gun. First class mastery badge. It's difficult to get an ace tanker badge in this machine because so many people do so incredibly well at it. That was 5087 damage done in a Tier 10 match. <laughs> it wasn't good enough for race tanker. Uh, special attention to, here he is, the 5916. He only did 86 damage, but he came out of that with 580 base experience. Because, spotting damage, right there, 2,792, nearly 3,000 spotting damage. Well done to that guy. Doing what you should be doing in a scout tank in a tier 10 game like that. So, from one tier 9 tank destroyer in a tier 10 match to another tier 9 tank destroyer in a tier 10 match, this is the Yag Tiger, one of my favourite and one of my most successful machines in World of Tanks. This match is a bit of a nostalgia trip for you. It's actually on the old Redshire. That hill doesn't exist anymore. My record of 10 kills in one game was in the Yag Tiger in a tier 9 match on the port map, which is no longer in World of Tanks either. Well, that's not strictly true. I did manage to score 12 kills in one game, but that was in the Tetrarch, and low-tier games don't really count. There's too much light seal clubbing. 10 kills in the Yag Tiger is the best I've ever done while playing World of Tanks. And, of course, I didn't get a pools medal out of it because it was before the pools medal even existed, so... <laughs> oh, well. Initially, I'm thinking of going for this ridge line, but we've got two Tier 10 tank destroyers. 268 and an E4 heading up here and it's gonna it's just gonna be too crowded up there so instead I've wasted some time now moving up here turn the tank around head to the other side I'm platooned up with Quickie Baby in the AMX 5120 and, and Ike I'm not gonna be in a position to support them for most of this match it's pretty much just gonna be me um, as I said, I was going to head to that ridge, but there's just it's just too crowded up there at the moment. Instead, heading over to the other side, trying to support these guys with the Object 704 up there. We've got an IS-7 going over, there's an IS-3. And I'm hoping these guys are going, to, are going to push, but it looks like it's all hands to camping stations, and it's going to get equally crowded up here. The IS-7's going for it. Surprisingly, the Object 704 is going for it as well. Unsurprisingly, the IS-3 isn't. We've got a T-62 doing an aggressive run up the ridge of the hill in the middle. And he's already made contact. I'm not expecting the IS-3 to be able to do much. But I should be able to. The Yag Tiger's gun... Oh, great. Typical. We've lost contact, but we can see trees falling. I'll take a blind shot anyway. The Yag Tiger's gun has a very, very good rate of fire for a 128mm gun. It does good damage, it has good penetration. It's just an all-round good gun. You're probably not going to like your Yag Tiger until you have this gun. 
this gun is really what makes the machine. Don't have effective shots at him. But then the guys on the ridge pop back up again. Oh, an object 704. Lovely. Oh, and he's got a friend with him. The rate of fire of the Yak Tiger's gun surprises people. Oh, Ferdinand. <laughs> it really does have an impressively good damage output. Come to daddy. Oh, it bounced. Unlucky. And we've got to give full credit to the guys who were spotting. Ugh, that was a poorly aimed shot. But the rate of fire with this gun is impressively good. And that's more like it. There are not many tier 9 tank destroyers. When you fire the BL-10 on the Object 704, when you fire the big, you know, any tank destroyer with a really big gun with a really long reload is especially frustrating if you fire a fully aimed shot and you miss. Or if you fire a badly aimed shot and you miss. With the Yag Tiger, you get second chances that you don't get with other comparable tank destroyers because it fires relatively quickly compared to other machines of the same tier and class. I feel like the Yag Tiger really sits in the sweet spot for tier 9 tank destroyers as far as the guns are concerned. At one end of the scale you've got the Object 704, which has 750 average damage but a very, very long reload. At the other end of the scale, you've got machines like the Fosh and the Tortoise, which have faster rate of fire than the Yag Tiger, but the average damage roll is only 400. With the 560 average damage roll of the Yag Tiger and the respectable rate of fire, I just feel like it really sits in that sweet spot when the tier 9 tank destroyers are concerned, and that you've got fearsome alpha damage, and yet you still have a respectable rate of fire. For me, that's what makes the Yag Tiger so fearsome. Of course, you can't have everything. Uh, the Yag Tiger has good armour. It has an amazing gun. The mobility? Not so good. It's not as slow as the Tortoise, but it's nowhere near as fast as the Fosh, and it's not even as fast in a straight line as the Object 704, but one thing it does have over the Object 704 is legendary accuracy. That is not the kind of shot you could be expected to pull off with a BL-10. The gun that I'm using on the Yag Tiger right now, the uh, Pack 44 128mm L61, is of course, it's a fantasy gun, like the BL-10 on the Object 704. But like the BL-10 on the Object 704, it's based on the actual gun that the machine used. It's just a longer barreled version. The actual gun that the Yag Tiger used in reality is the stock gun that you get on the Yag Tiger. It's the L55 version of this 128mm gun. It was capable of penetrating over 200 millimeters of 30 degree sloped armor at a range of a kilometer. It could penetrate 148 millimeters of armor at 30 degree slope at two kilometers. It was the most powerful anti-tank gun in use during the Second World War. Despite being an impressive machine, the Yag Tiger operationally was not a success. There were too few of them employed too late and with two inexperienced crews to make any kind of difference to the outcome of World War II. The legendary German Tiger race, Otto Karius, after being wounded on the Eastern Front, was transferred from hospital to command a company of Jag Tigers. One of them got stuck in a shell crater and was taken out by Panzerfausts, fired by a Volkssturm unit who had no idea what it was. They'd never seen one before. They thought it was an American machine. It also suffered from problems typical to late war German machines in that they were just too ambitious designs for the manufacturing capability that Germany had at that stage of the war. The gun on the Yak Tiger, for example, while impressive, had to be recalibrated if the machine was driven off-road even for a short period of time due to vibrations and jarring upsetting the aiming mechanism. The biggest problem, of course, was the low morale and lack of experience of the crews. It was a deadly machine, but in one engagement near Unna, on the Western Front, one Yag Tiger from the front faced off against five American tanks. Two of the American tanks took one look at this beast and very wisely decided to get the hell out of there. The other three opened fire. None of them were able to penetrate the frontal armor, 250 millimeters at the front of the Yag Tiger. But the Yag Tiger commander panicked, turned the tank around, exposed the side, 
all six crew were lost. The combat record of Otto Karius's Panzerjäger Abteilung 512 was fairly typical of Jagdtigers. They managed to destroy one American tank for one Jagdtiger lost to combat, one to friendly fire, and eight others lost to breakdown or destroyed by their crews to prevent capture. Today, three Jagdtigers survive in museums. One is at the Bovington Tank Museum in England, one at the National Armour and Cavalry Museum in Fort Benning, Georgia, and one, of course, at the Kubinka Tank Museum near Moscow. As always, folks, take care on that battlefield, and I'll catch you next time.